morning, everybody. Biodum, thank you for that introduction. So I welcome you all to this briefing. I'm accompanied today by the Director General of the uh, NAFDAC, National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control, uh, Professor Adeyeye. I'm also accompanied by the Executive Director of National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, Dr. Faisal Shuaib, who is responsible for administration of vaccines in Nigeria. And joining us soon will also be the uh, Director General of Nigeria Center for Disease Control, NCDC, Dr. Chikwe Ehekwazu. Now, uh, I will just give you a brief background and overview of the situation. The Nigerian government responds the COVID-19 pandemic, which was first reported, as we all know, on the 27th of February, 2020. And our response you can put into four major categories. First is surveillance, which will include prevention of importation, case finding by testing for COVID-19 disease and all in an attempt to prevent transmission within the country. The second is the treatment of confirmed cases and the obse uh, observance of uh, infection prevention and control measures. Third is how we administer vaccines to eligible population and included in that will be the measures around confirming the kind of vaccines that we are using and finally, very important, that in spite of all the uh, anxiety about COVID-19, that we sustain other health services, that other health services in the country are not abandoned or left to fall between the cracks. Now, since the month of August this year, we began to see a rise in our COVID-19 cases. And uh, that is where we officially declared that we are seeing the so-called third wave, the surge, which has been generally attributed to the Delta variant of the virus. With a background overview of the pandemic in Nigeria, as of 11th of August, 2021, the government of Nigeria has confirmed just the following statistics which by now maybe have changed a little bit, but I gave you the date that this come from, that the total number of confirmed cases has, is 179,118. Active cases are 10,783. The number of discharge cases, 166,144. And sadly, the number of fatalities is 2,000. 194. Further details will be provided by the operational leads when they begin to make their own presentation. So we have declared that Nigeria is officially in the third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, as you know, it has already spread in many parts of the world, mostly in India where it was first recognized, spread into Indonesia, Thailand, Burma, Bangladesh, and also many parts of Africa, including West Africa, where the spread has gone on from Senegal through Ghana, all around us. There has been in all these areas a marked increase in the number of Delta variant confirmed, and that is what necessitates this brief to Nigerians on plans that the government is putting in place to manage these rising cases recorded in the country and to mitigate the spread of this variant in our country. Following the recent COVID-19 vaccination of some Nigerians with AstraZeneca vaccine and the recent receipt of about 4 million doses, 4 million and 80 to be precise, of uh, the Moderna 19 vaccine from the United States government, and we thank them for that. 
There is an addition of other vaccines being expected, both from the Africa Vaccine Acquisition Task Team, AVAT, and also from bilateral agreements that we make with other countries who send us the vaccines either through COVAX or in some cases directly like the government of India that sent us 100,000 doses of the AstraZeneca. If we work together, and this is not only government, it's also got to do with citizens, agencies, and not the least, the media, we do have a good chance of scaling through this COVID-19 third wave threat. And I want to thank all Nigerians in front for the support and participation so far, which has made this battle, well, let us say, controllable, and the successful implementation of non-pharmaceutical interventions and public health measures since we started this vaccination and since this epidemic came in remains very, very important. Therefore, everyone has a role to play, the government, citizens, media, partners, NGOs, CBOs and CSOs, traditional rulers, political leaders, community leaders, all have a role to play in here. This is a collective effort, it's a national effort. What is surveillance update? Now cases have started to rise gradually since several weeks, and also there have been weekly increase in fatalities recorded in the past four weeks or so. Currently, the states that have the highest contribution to the national caseload of COVID-19 are Lagos, Akwa Ibom, Rivers, Oyo, Ogun, AKT, and the FCT. These are the ones we have called the red alert states. And we call them that because they require extra attention to contain the COVID-19 uh, outbreak in those places. The World Health Organization did classify the variants and call them the Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and of late, the Lambda variant. And these are variants of concern. Now, the country is particularly concerned about the Delta variant because it is much more transmissible it has been estimated to be 60% more transmissible, which means that where one virus of the previous variants will infect 100 people, this particular one will infect 160 people. That's a lot. Secondly, this variant is also of concern because it affects even younger people. Before now, we did say that younger people would, like, would largely get away on scale from the infection. And uh, we spec the vaccination from 18 years upwards. But this Delta variant attacks people. And uh, remember, we also did say that those who suffered most from the COVID-19 were those who had underlying ailments. But this variant seems to care less. It does not discriminate too much whether you have underlying ailments or not. And we have seen cases, even this morning, I saw on TV a 14-year-old who had been in coma and was just recovering from this disease. So those are the reasons why the concern about COVID Delta variant is very, very uh, high. So the non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions, that is to say the public health uh, measures, are still extremely important because that is the main weapon we still have, and it works. It is something that we can rely on. Wearing of masks, using sanitizers, social distancing, avoiding crowds, and also generally observing hygiene if you have a cough or a cold, and reporting when you do not feel well. You might hear me repeating this over and over again because it's critical. Now, uh, until we have received and vaccinated enough people, 
and our target is 70% of our eligible population, we cannot begin to think of relaxing. Even countries who have done much higher vaccination, the US has, for example, vaccinated 61% of the population fully, and the UK even higher. But they are still seeing a lot more cases, and they are panicking, uh, uh, just as we are, about the impact of the Delta variant in their countries. But one thing that is clear, and I can say that up front also, is that for those who are vaccinated fully, and they get infected with the variant, the Delta variant, have a much better chance of recovery. A less, a le a, a less percentage of them will get uh, into a hospital or into ICU, and fewer fatalities, so that the vaccination does help. And that is why all countries are prioritizing this vaccination, and we are doing that too. Now, what do we do about the points of entry? Now, points of entry are the, way, are the pathways by which persons coming from outside enter our country by air, there are five airports, and by land and by sea. Now, the competent public health authority is the Port Health Service of Nigeria, currently manning about five, five international airports, nine seaports, and several land borders. COVID-19 came in by importation, by people who traveled into the country. Therefore, as we try to take control of the transmission in country, we also do not lose, uh, the, uh, lose, lose sight of the fact that even more can still be coming in. That, that is why this uh, particular uh, topic is very, very important. Following the confirmation of this third wave, the Port Health Services has heightened surveillance at, at all points of entry, screening all passengers coming into the country uh, from major points of entry. There are persons of interest from red countries. The red countries, again, those countries where there is particularly high uh, occurrence and uh, prevalence of this Delta variant. At the moment, they are India, Brazil, Turkey, and South Africa. And once they are identified uh, as coming from these areas, they are taken into government-approved quarantine facilities and observed for a period of time. And uh, where possible, uh, samples are taken for sequencing to confirm whether the virus they, are came, they came with, if they are positive, is of the Delta variant or any other variant. Now, we also do verification of the PCR results to detect Fake results. There are some people who come into the country with fake PCR results because before you come into Nigeria, you are supposed to have done a PCR test within 72 hours prior to that. Sadly, we do see fake results coming in, but they will be detected here because there are control measures in place to do that. Violators and defaulters are immediately taken to quarantine facilities and handed over to security agencies for prosecution. The portal service has also now commenced testing at land borders, uh, doing rapid diagnostic set uh, tests, which we have uh, instigated and are going to expand. They are presently going on in Seme and Idi Roko. We are going to expand them in other areas. And within the first week when we started border control testing, we discovered six positive cases at the land border. One of them, uh, who is not a citizen of our country, was returned, not allowed to enter. And uh, the others uh, uh, were sent for further uh, investigation and uh, the measures that we take. Now, what's the situation with vaccine? The federal government, through the National Primary Health Care Development Agency and NAFDAQ, has taken several actions with regard to vaccines. The target, as I said earlier, is to vaccinate 70% of Nigerians to get what we call herd immunity. That herd immunity means that the likelihood of transmission from one person to the other is grossly reduced. But to achieve that 70%, uh, uh, most Nigerians have to submit themselves to vaccination. And I can say here, you hear me say it again, that this vaccine is safe, 
They have been tested. They have been taken by every by many persons. His Excellency, the President, the Vice President, Senate President, many traditional rulers, religious leaders, they have all taken this vaccine. So this vaccine hesitancy is uncalled for. This morning, again, I saw on TV a family that had been totally against vaccination. And they had said they would not take until their 14-year-old daughter came down so sick with COVID-19, had to be taken to intensive care, 14-year-old, mind you. Intensive care, I was just lucky to survive. And then that's when the family realized that this thing is real, and they all went to go and take the vaccination and urged their neighbors to take the vaccination. Now, we have received 4 million doses, 4 million and 24 doses of AstraZeneca uh, COVID-19 vaccine, with which we vaccinated just over 2 million citizens. And uh, they, most of them, about 1.2 million got complete doses, and uh, about uh, 600 or 700 got only partial doses, but we are expecting more to come so that they can get their uh, second doses. Now, the vaccine exercise has been, for that particular tranche, has been successfully implemented in all states, and because the vaccine ran out, uh, it ended around the 8th of July. We don't have any more vaccines. Now, getting vaccines at this time is, ex is extremely difficult because Nigeria does not produce any. In fact, Africa does not produce any except South Africa that manufactures Johnson & Johnson under license from a US company. So therefore, many countries producing vaccines have been reserving these vaccines for themselves. And a, a, a huge advocacy has gone on from the World Health Organization and many other organizations calling for equity in vaccine distribution. So we are just now began to receive vaccines uh, with uh, the Moderna vaccine that just arrived and we are expecting uh, uh, very soon doses of Johnson & Johnson, uh, Pfizer, AstraZeneca in our country. So uh, in addition to the 4 million and 80 doses of Moderna vaccine from the United States government, which came through the COVAX facility, Nigeria we has paid for 29 million 850 doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccine working through the African Union facility that I spoke of earlier, the AVAT facility. This Johnson & Johnson vaccine is particularly useful because it's a single shot vaccine and it's useful, very useful for mobile populations, those are itinerant workers who move from town to town. It is very useful for people who live in hard to reach areas maybe villages in difficult places up on top of hills, inside the creeks, or in uh, very lonely, deserted areas, places where it is difficult to get to. So you only need to go there once and give them the shot and save yourself a second journey in there. It's also good for nomadic populations who move from place to place, and you might not get a chance of uh, uh, getting them a second time. So we're expecting, again, uh, another batch of 176,000 doses before the end of the week to begin that uh, particular series of vaccines. The NPACDA will give more information about that, but we also have, we have information that Nigeria will have another 3.9 uh, billion doses of AstraZeneca and about 3.577 doses of Pfizer through the COVAX facility within this month or at the beginning of next month. So we shall begin to have not only many, many uh, vaccines, but also a variety of vaccines. And I can add here that six vaccines have been approved by NAVDAQ. Without that approval, we do not use the vaccine. And the approval is very strict and also very, very uh, well controlled. Now, the phase two of vaccination in all states plus FCT is scheduled to begin after, uh, that's at the beginning of this month, that's from the 16th onward, uh, where immediately the due diligence uh, of NAFDAQ has been carried out and uh, the vaccines are released for uh, uh, engagement. Remember that the Moderna 
we are, we are using for the first time. Up to now, we have used AstraZeneca. And because the new vaccine, it's, it's working in all the countries where it has been used. Uh, NAVDAC is doing all the due diligence to keep Nigeria away from any harm. And I also want to mention here, at this point, that because vaccines have become big business, there are many fake vaccines going around. There are people who are very busy manufacturing fake vaccines. There have been reports of whole provinces, not in Nigeria, whole provinces in other countries where they carried out vaccines in the whole province only to discover that what they were injecting was water. And the criminals are also going around uh, uh, trying to sell vaccines to, to several unsuspecting uh, countries. That's why Nigeria makes its own purchase, not from private sources. We get from the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team, we get from COVAX, and we get from bilateral, which means from another government. And after getting those vaccines, we also do very stringent due diligence here by NAVDAC, and then they are properly stored, properly administered through NAVDAC and NPACDA, so that Nigerians are uh, protected. And we also do a lot of uh, follow-up after vaccine to make sure that Nigerians are okay. Now, sensitization of Nigerians on the need to receive available vaccines is currently on ongoing all over the country. And uh, uh, those who do not understand the urgency for vaccines need to be made to understand. And that is where the media play a very important role here. There are a lot of mischief makers on social media who try to tell the opposite stories and give all sorts of con contrary evidence that create uh, confusion in the minds of people. And it's not only in Nigeria, it's many places, places in the world that this is going on. If you look at uh, certain clips that are uh, going around, uh, 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 false stories, disinformation and misinformation is going on. We need to count, uh, counter that and encourage our people not to fear these vaccines. It's helpful and useful for all of us. Now, the challenges we have observed during the first phase of the vaccination included hesitancy, the global shortage of vaccines for vaccinating of eligible population, the recent detection of the Delta variant, which has given everybody cause for concern. The president, in his wisdom, set up the presidential steering committee, and before that was the presidential task force, which has done a fantastic job in bringing all the ministries that are concerned with response together to uh, examine the whole uh, uh, panorama of uh, responding to this uh, infection, and uh, has done a very great job in uh, looking after the uh, needs of our country. Now, it is this uh, task, uh, the Presidential Steering Committee, that has uh, categorized states into red states, both inside the country and also those uh, outside the country. Again, let me say that the vaccines are safe, they are effective, we are giving them to everyone who is 18 years and, be, and, and above according to a fixed set that prioritizes health workers and those who have, who are, uh, have uh, underlying ailments and those who are above the age of uh, uh, 60, 50 or 60 and uh, uh, or have uh, some Im immune comp compromise. So if you are eligible, you can go to a nearby health facility to receive your own vaccination. Now, case management. How do we manage the cases of people who are already, who are infected? As I said, many people will be infected and will have no symptoms, and you will not know. There are others who are infected and they have a mild symptoms, and then they will think it's just so, oh, maybe cold or malaria, and they might be all right. But there are a few people who become very, very sick. And those are the ones who need to go into hospital. And the case management pillar plays a significant role in containment of COVID-19 pandemic by ensuring isolation and admission of symptomatic confirmed cases and coordinating the management of these cases to achieve good outcomes. There, we have about 125 functional isolation and treatment centers as I speak. And uh, 
only 8% of them are occupied right now, which means that there's plenty of room if we do suffer a huge deluge of infections with uh, 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 serious symptoms. We give continuous supportive supervision to these centers. Many of them are run by the state, but a lot of them are also run in every of our teaching hospital and FMC. And uh, we enhance informed decisions for appropriate intervention. All federal tertiary hospitals have been supported to have an isolation center, a 10-bedded ICU, and a molecular laboratory so that they can be able to take care of critical, severe cases. Very, very mild cases are taken care of in their homes in what we call home-based management. And the money for, for, for carrying out all of this has been released by the uh, government. Now, working with the WHO, we have carried out assessment of our oxygen readiness at uh, 125 isolation and treatment centers, and they will identify the gaps that require attention. And in view of that, the federal government established 38 high capacity oxygen plants in Nigeria. And in addition, we received support from the Global Fund, which normally takes supports us in treating AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. They decided to also support us in treating the uh, COVID-19 uh, 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 pandemic. And uh, in addition, they are supporting us with 12 additional oxygen plants. They're helping us to repair all oxygen plants that we had before, which were not functional, which had issues with, repair, with uh, repairing them. There are almost 30. And we are also going to have 12 oxygen tanks, liquid oxygen tanks as backup in major areas where COVID-19 is treated. They will all be strategically located so that no facility needs to go too far before they find oxygen. How are we preparing for this new wave? Well, we are reactivating our emergency operation centers especially beginning with the high burden states, which I've mentioned, and reactivating uh, all uh, treatment centers, both old and new, across the country. And we have been supplying ICU equipment, consumables, and uh, PPEs to all our uh, centers. And uh, while we are waging this relentless war to combat the spread of COVID-19, it is important to add that other diseases of public health interest are also around the corner. Uh, recently, we have been dealing with cholera, uh, which has ravaged the country. We are responding, working with the Ministry of Environment, uh, Ministry of Water Resources, and so on. But that's not the subject of now, but just to tell you that we are not leaving anything out of sight, okay? And I would like to again assure all of you that government is on top of this situation. The Ministry of Health and relevant agencies are deploying all necessary machinery and strategies needed to contain the spread and the impact of this disease. We have also been training intensive care specialists. Uh, the last batch was uh, South, South and Southeast. Those who are going to man ventilators and oxygen as, uh, therapy have been receiving training uh, recently the uh, USAID offered us again some more training. We are very uh, grateful for this uh, uh, vaccination, uh, for this uh, help that they are giving to us. Now, I want to urge all Nigerians to first of all, observe the non-pharmaceutical interventions and what we call the public health measures. For infection prevention and control, they are extremely necessary and the most important that we have uh, the most important and the cheapest and easiest tool that we have. Your mask, social distancing, avoiding crowds, particularly in this very dangerous period. Crowds you will find if you are going to places of worship, market, clubs, parties, all those can be high risk at this time of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, finally, I want to ask that you help us to brief your readers and listeners in all uh, the points 
that we have brought forward now and uh, to free free to ask questions or come to the Ministry of Health. We have a department of, um, we have a media department there that can provide answers. You can also speak to any of the two ministers and get all the information you want so that you do not allow fake news to take control of the space. So, um, <coughs> Honorable Minister of Health, DG, we are in the third wave, but we are not where we were in the first or second. We, we know more, we have more tools, and we are more determined uh, than ever before. Um, yesterday, we recorded the highest number of single cases in a day in the third wave. We had higher numbers on a day in the second wave, but really, day to day, week to week, over the last few weeks, our cases are increasing. Um, while bed occupancy is fairly low nationally, in Lagos is up to 35%, and in some hospitals in Lagos, providing care is up to 70%. So these cases are not equally distributed across the country. So averages hide details. So we need to look into our data. The CITREP is put on the website every single week. So I invite all of you to look at it and look at it in detail. So you can then ask uh, states specifically what is happening in their states because our responsibility at the national level is to provide a national figures. But below that, you can see different levels of the epidemic in different states, which is very important. Nationally, the single most important indicator that we, man we monitor is what we call the test positivity ratio. So the number of positives out of all those tested. And in the last two weeks, uh, this has risen to 8%. So eight out of 100 tests are now positive. So very clearly, we are seeing an increase in cases across the country, and we have to respond. What is driving this increase? There are always three ways to think about it. The virus, what we are doing uh, as individuals, and then the, res the public health response. In terms of individuals, it's not news to any of us that many of us have dropped uh, those critical uh, measures that we need to carry out. We see events happening all over the country. We see very few people wearing masks. The consequences uh, will be obvious, unfortunately, unless we go back to some of these restrictions. Secondly is the virus. 80% of all recently sequenced viruses are the Delta variant. 80%. So this is a much more transmissible virus. 80% of all those that we have sequenced with all our sequencing partners in Nigeria in the last four weeks are the Delta variant. So this is what is driving infections. Now, what tools do we have? And this is really at the heart of my comments uh, today. What tools do we have for prevention? What tools do we have for detection? And what tools do we have for the response? In terms of prevention, our tools, the most important new tool we have is vaccination. And my brother, the ED, will, uh, and the DG of NAVDAC will say a lot about this particular area, what we can do, what government is doing, what individuals uh, need to do. In terms of what we can do, again, to prevent, everyone in this room is wearing a mask. We need to consistently do this in every uh, setup, wherever we are. It's not comfortable, but this is a price we have to pay. The alternative is uh, much, much worse. So we have to continue doing what we can do in prevention and ask ourselves, what tools do we have? Secondly, what tools do we have in detection? We have, we are definitely not where we were earlier. We have our warehouses are full of uh, laboratory tests. We're supporting the states to use this. We're thinking of different methods to increase access through whatever program is already existing in the st states. So by detecting more, we're able to respond, and the states have done an incredibly good job. Most states in scaling up, not just the lab capacity, which is something we talk about all the time, but sustaining the people that are collecting these samples, and I really want to give credit to public health workers at the state uh, level to do this. The second bit 
It's our sequencing capacity that tells us what type of virus, virus what variant, and what characteristics they have. And definitely, our pa uh, partners at the Africa Center for Excellence in Genomics, NEDA, the Nigeria Institute for Medical Research, and ourselves really working together at the National Reference Lab to make sure we're able to define the variants causing transmission in Nigeria. And thirdly, it's our ability to respond. What tools do we have? Uh, the Honorable Minister has defined the extensive investments now being made in rolling out our oxygen infrastructure in the states and federal institutions it will be very critical. We're supporting every treatment facility with all the infection prevention and control commodities that they need. So in terms of preparing for this third wave, we are preparing, but the issue is that the system is what it is. So we know the fragility of our health uh, care systems across board. The challenges uh, that we have in managing it, uh, the various needs in federal and state institutions. So we, we don't want to stress this system to find out whether it will survive or not. So the best tool we really have is really to focus on prevention uh, so that our systems are not overwhelmed. So I'll, I'll pause on COVID there and really be open to any questions you might have on any aspect of uh, the outbreak. i say two final words, one on cholera, like the Honorable Minister has said. Um, we must remind ourselves that as much as we focus on, on COVID, a cholera is a disaster in Nigeria right now. Uh, we've lost more people from cholera this year than from COVID. It's unfortunate that the are the cadres of society that don't get a lot of attention. We have been appealing to everyone concerned, our state government, our healthcare workers, communities, to do what they need to do. In the short term, we're already in an outbreak. So there are certain things that we can't do now. But what we can do now is to insist on boiling our water as much as we can, do massive chlorination by local chlorine, and chlorinate the water we are using and use it to disinfect our uh, tools, our utensils, and to try to prevent uh, transmission at the moment. If you see anyone in your community um, practicing open defecation for whatever reason, look for some ways to manage that situation with whatever local tools you have. But in the longer term, uh, all of us have a responsibility to really push for increased investment in wash infrastructure. What do I mean by wash infrastructure? Both among the rich and the poor, we are in trouble. We used to have water reticulation systems in our cities. Now, every middle class household in Nigeria relies on a borehole. Boreholes have intrinsic challenges. The poor rely on water fetched from downstream when someone is defecating upstream into the same stream. So we need to ed educate our people we need to encourage our state governments to invest in water distribution and really raise this with your support up the agenda in the press, in the media, among uh, our politicians as we go into the next uh, election cycle in Nigeria. So really, cholera is a massive problem. We have outbreaks in 22 of the 36 plus one states in Nigeria have ongoing outbreaks right now. And we need to save those lives as much as we need to save the lives of people with COVID. And finally, you would have heard the announcement of uh, a case of Marburg virus in Guinea. Uh, Marburg is a sister brother virus to the Ebola virus um, with all the potentials to cause uh, spread and panic. Yesterday, we carried out a risk assessment at the Nigeria Center for Disease Control we have an Ebola working group that's constantly on the alert. So we're putting together a plan right now. I can assure Nigerians we have uh, the reagents to detect cases should they occur. Of course, our Port Health Services team has been on the alert uh, since early this year and will continue to do that. Uh, but uh, really to assure everyone that we're on top of this, we'll do what we need to do to be able to detect if we have a case and to respond if necessary. But for now, um, we continue to respond to the outbreaks we're dealing with day to day. So thank you very much. I uh, look forward to your questions.
Uh, good morning. In terms of uh, the COVID pandemic and NAVDAC, uh, I'm going to talk on six areas. Uh, first is the preparedness that NAVDAC has had. And then the review of the dossiers or the package uh, for each vaccine as they come. And then approval of the dossiers. Then thirdly, the stringent review of the approved vaccines, meaning we've reviewed the dossiers. Then when the vaccines come, we, str we use stringent measures to ensure that what we read, what we assess, is what is coming to the country. Fourthly, once the vaccines arrive through our ports, inspection directorate, then we start uh, or we set up what is called traceability, and I will expand on that. Once primary health starts the distribution and delivery of the vaccines, we partner with them and we start doing safety monitoring. That is the fifth aspect of what I'm going to talk about. And the sixth aspect is continuous, continuous information sharing and sensitization about COVID, non-pharmaceutical uh, means to prevent it, and of course, met, uh, the safety monitoring, sensitization about it. I will be talking about all this. Uh, NAVDAC started this journey around April of 2020 in terms of preparedness, having tens and tens of meetings, workshops with different agencies across the world to prepare us, first to make us understand what is COVID-19 disease, and then the vaccines that will be coming in later. Meetings with WHO, with International Coalition of Medicine Regulatory Authorities, with African Union Smart Safety Surveillance, training of our staff. We launched Med Safety App uh, October last year. It is a device, a uh, mobile device that can be used to record any side effect from any drug. But it came in on time, or it was timely when it arrived, that we started using it for COVID-19 vaccine in terms of side effects that a patient or a vaccinee uh, may experience. Then we started trading across the, world, across the country. Our staff, we partnered, collaborated with MPH, uh, MPHCDA, started training the disease uh, specialists across the country how to use Med Safety App. Why is it so important? It is important to record any side effects, whether serious or non-serious, because what we were going to give is emergency use authorization. It is not full approval. Any drug that is given emergency use authorization has to be followed up carefully to be monitored in what we call the phase four. Uh, when a product is being developed, it goes through preclinical studies and then when goes through clinical studies, phases one, two, three. What differentiates between phases one, two, three is the number of subjects or volunteers that are used. After passing phases one, two, three, phase four is when it is now being used by a larger population. And in this case, all the vaccines have gone through phases one, two, three. And when they now come to our country, we get into phase four, although it's still emergency use or authorization, but we have to be very vigilant. And we trained ourselves, or we were trained, or trained others on how to be vigilant once the vaccine's coming. Our first vaccine was uh, Covishield or AstraZeneca uh, from India. And we were, thank God, we were well prepared for that. And because we dealt with the manufacturer 
personally, I dealt with the manufacturer in India to get the information that we needed. We were able to track and trace every vaccine, AstraZeneca vaccine, the four, the four million that came into the country. And I will be talking about that. So this training stage was extremely important of preparedness. NAVDAC was the first regulatory authority in Africa to write the preparedness guidance. It's on our website. Then, we, after the COVID shield, we were able to get the dossier directly from them. But then there's a mechanism through which you have to go through WHO to get the dossiers. We started receiving the dossier. Of course, we approved COVID shield February 18 of this year, and then we started re receiving other dossiers. The dossier is everything to do, has everything to do with the development. From when it's been tested in the, in the petri dish, with various or using cells, cell lines, to animals, to humans. Then there are those years when they come to us, we use stringent measures to review the dossier. The fact that other countries might have approved that are stringent doesn't mean we will take their word for it. We check, we spend about 15 days reviewing the doses, and it is multidisciplinary committee. NAVDAC is a scientific organization made up of pharmacists, scientists, biochemists, name them. So we come together, uh, the vaccine committee comes together to review uh, each dossier. Thus far, I mentioned we have reviewed uh, AstraZeneca India, we have re reviewed and approved AstraZeneca India, AstraZeneca Korea, Pfizer, BioNTech, Johnson & Johnson, Moderna, Sputnik V. And now we are working on Sinopharm from China. I mentioned that we have to use stringent review of the approved vaccines. Once we approve them, that doesn't mean we're going to just take them when they come. They come with information. We take samples at the airport, cold, store, cold room, and we analyze in our lab. Because we want to be sure that what we read in the dossier actually matches what we are testing in the lab. Why? Because the health of our own people is premium to us. Our mandate is to safeguard the health of our people. So once we then declare from the lab testing and death review, other review that we do on paper, we approve. We approved Moderna vaccine a few days ago. But with the arrival of the Moderna vaccine, we found out that the barcoding that is needed for the traceability was not full barcoding compared to the COVID shield that we got from India. India is a little bit more advanced in barcoding, labeling, and it has nothing to do with the quality, no. It is just ability to be able to track using barcoding, uh, how the vaccines move. So what we then had to do with the Moderna vaccine is to add another label to the packaging. Again, it has nothing to do with the quality. We have approved it as a quality, you know, very good quality, safe, and efficacious product. As we speak, about 30 of our staff are working to affix this secondary labeling that will make us, like we did for COVID Shield, to track and trace every vaccine via or doses or whatever that will be administered in the country. For COVID Shield, Nigeria is the first country to use the track and trace GS1 driven technology to track COVID-19 vaccine. We are the only country <laughs> that has done that. And we were at a meeting with Oxford University where uh, AstraZeneca was made uh, last week, Monday, and they now call what we are doing the Abuja principles. We are building on that because why? Our motor now is customer focus, 
agency driven and country dedicated. We've got to project the image of this country positively. And we, NAVDAC works around the clock, especially with this COVID vaccine, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so with the COVID shield, we were able to use that technology to track and trace across 34 states and FCT. Because it's new, we weren't able to catch, I think the, the internet connectivity in two states weren't good enough for us to follow up the monitoring. But now we are ready and we're going to uh, follow up the distribution of Moderna vaccine. Why is this so important? Because of falsification. Substandard falsified medicines are flying all over. And we want to be sure that what we got is what the patient is going to be given. Uh, so this track and trace is to prevent falsification or to monitor the vaccines to make sure there is no uh, infiltration. So that is the fourth point, traceability. I mentioned that. And uh, for Moderna, we're going to do that. Uh, what, <laughs> what is very interesting in what we did is that we use what is called GLN or global location numbers, almost like what you use for GPS in your vehicle. So we were able to use, uh, to have 440 locations in Nigeria that we are located global location numbers too. So that if a vaccine is at location number one, it is tracked. And it is different from the one that is location number 420 or whatever. So very good things are coming out of this uh, pandemic as far as uh, the regulatory system uh, is concerned. Now that primary health is delivering the vaccine, we get into action in terms of pharmacovigilance. One of our core mandates is pharmacovigilance and post-marketing surveillance. We didn't do this alone. We collaborated with, with uh, primary health, and we, take, we took this also continental to African Union Smart Safety Surveillance. And when I mentioned to them that we are working with primary health, in order to ensure that the delivery of the vaccine will be optimum. The four countries that are in the steering committee, NAVDAC or Nigeria, Ghana, Ethiopia, and South Africa, WHO told them, use Nigerian format, working with the primary health to ensure effective delivery of the vaccines. So a lot of things going on for us as a country. Uh, but it is not just that I want to bring in what the government has done. Because of the neglect of the health sector for decades, the government realized that they have to capacitate health sector, and NAVDAC is one of them. So the government gave some money to redo our vaccine lab. We are doing that as we speak. It was approved about two, three weeks ago, uh, by FEC, at FEC, rather. So it is not just now, it is what will be sustainable or what we're going to be sustaining uh, in the future. So coming back to safety monitoring, we, I mentioned that we have trained people across the country. We have two pharmacovigilance officers per, per state, working with primary health and using med safety hub to catch any side effects. We've been very successful. We have over 12,000 reports of different side effects and we now have to collect all this and put in a database called VGBase, which is operated by WHO. Uh, so why is this so important? I mentioned that there's a continuous sharing of information by all regulatory agencies across the world. We meet every other week. So that whatever package insert came with the vaccine, or the leaflet insert, that the thing that you pull out and start reading, may be modified. For example, AstraZeneca package insert has been modified because of the report that we regulators uh, make globally. So that if there is headache that was observed uh, that was not there before, then they put headache just to protect uh, the public. And finally, uh, sensitization, sensitization, sensitization. Extremely important. We have to be very transparent. 
when we talk about COVID-19 vaccine, when I was getting my jab, I asked uh, about to get it. I asked my brother here, Dr. Faisal. I said, I react to things. Please bring EpiPen when you are coming to give me my jab. EpiPen is <laughs> adrenaline that once you pass out, you can easily be brought back. And when they came to my office to give me the jab, I said, where is the EpiPen? And this, are, this is all you know, in the media. Why? Because I know my body. And it will not be because of the vaccine, it's because I, I react easily. And uh, when they were about to give me, I said, where's the adrenaline? And they laughed. But even before I got it, I took a uh, Panadol, like two hours before. As a mother, whenever I, we were take, I was taking my children to, for vaccination, I give them uh, Panadol, uh, just to be sure that if they have temperature, it will be. So it's the same thing as COVID-19 vaccine. So we have to be real about it. So I took a Panadol two hours before and also asked, where's the adrenaline? You know, thank God nothing happened to me. Uh, but why am I saying this? When you are developing a product, you have to make sure that you document the side effects. For COVID-19 vaccine, the benefits far outweigh the risks. For example, when they talk of blood clot and whatnot, you have one case in one million. That is statistically insignificant. To the person that had it, it is significant. Because without any side effect, there will never be any drug developed. So the reason for collating all these uh, side effects is to make sure uh, that we get everything right, dotted the I's and uh, cross the T's. So sensitization is every, very important. We've been doing that using med safety app. It's a five minute video uh, every week on NTA or TVC. We're going to go back now that we get in the second rollout. So I want to assure Nigeria that anything that goes through NAVDAC and come to primary health is safe for our people. Does it mean that people will not have a few side effects here and there? They will. But I got mine and I'm smiling. Thank you very much. God bless. Your Excellency, uh, the Honorable Minister of Health has covered uh, quite a large part of uh, what we're doing around uh, the deployment of vaccines. And uh, my sister, uh, Professor Adeye, uh, has also uh, eloquently covered uh, parts of uh, uh, the issues around how we're collaborating to make sure uh, that uh, we track and trace all vaccines to the sub-national level uh, so that we are very clear about where our vaccines are and to ensure that once we finish uh, the process of vaccination that we withdraw all the vials so that uh, yeah, criminals will not get a hold of the vials and uh, put in uh, you know, materials that may be harmful uh, to uh, our bodies. So we are very, very concerned about uh, the news of uh, fake vaccines occurring in other countries. Working together with NAFDAQ and the Federal Minister of Health we want to assure Nigerians that we're doing everything by the books to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, let me once again express our profound uh, appreciation to all Nigerians and in these Friends of Nigeria for the support that uh, we received during the first phase of the strategic uh, uh, rollout of uh, the uh, vaccination. Uh, later today, uh, we're going to be receiving uh, about 176,000 uh, doses uh, of uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that arrived uh, yesterday. So today we'll do a sort of a formal uh, review of the vaccines and then the coaching uh, equipment that are available to ensure that these vaccines maintain uh, their potency. Uh, the principle of the Presidential Steering Committee and uh, the Federal Ministry of Health, as guided by the Honorable Minister, is that these Johnson & Johnson vaccines are, are going to be prioritized for those who live in the hard-to-reach areas, the riverine areas, um, uh, mountainous areas, uh, itinerant workers, uh, people who uh, we have, uh, you know, concerns that once they take the first dose, they may not be available for the second dose. And using uh, GIS uh, technology, we've been able to map practically all populations in Nigeria. We know where these hard-to-reach populations are 
they are the ones that we're going to be prioritizing uh, to give the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine. Uh, now, in terms of uh, the uh, media reports around why we've delayed uh, the rollout of the vaccine, uh, Professor Ade has mentioned it, but I want to assure Nigerians that we're on track uh, to flag off the next phase of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout next week, uh, Monday. Uh, we are also expecting uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Our plan is that for those who have gotten the uh, first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine during the first phase, uh, there will be doses available to take uh, their second shots uh, in the next few weeks. Please make sure that you take uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine if that is what you took for the first dose. If you took first dose as AstraZeneca, please take the second dose as AstraZeneca. And if you're going to take Moderna as your first dose, also take it as your second dose. Uh, do not be concerned that you may not get the second dose of the AstraZeneca. Please do not mix and match the uh, vaccines. Uh, in this phase of the uh, COVID-19 rollout, we've mentioned that we're going to use a whole of uh, the family approach, bearing in mind that it is not... COVID-19 alone, that is our health challenge. In many of our communities, uh, we have people that are struggling with uh, paying bills for malaria, for pneumonia, for hypertension and diabetes. A lot of these conditions may go undiagnosed. Now that we're going into the communities with the COVID-19 vaccines, we're going to use the opportunity to also do screening for some of these non-communicable diseases, for malnutrition among our children. We're going to also provide routine immunization vaccines to our children so that we not only optimize the opportunity, but we save on costs and also send a very clear signal that the federal government, the state government, government from at every level cares about the health of Nigerians. We are also urging uh, that um, uh, people uh, are clear that it is important to continue uh, to, uh, uh, to use the non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions, to uh, apply them uh, because the vaccines from data that we have available will protect you against severe form, hospitalization, and death from COVID-19. However, the evidence that we have right now does not conclusively show that it will protect people from mild disease. There are people who have taken vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccines, but still get mild disease. Perhaps those individuals will have suffered even more if they did not have the, the vaccines. So just because you have taken the vaccine doesn't mean that uh, you can stop wearing the face mask. It is important to wear the face mask, but apart from that, you not only are you protecting yourself, you're also protecting uh, your loved ones and the community until we get to a stage where we achieve uh, herd immunity. And the plan, as the Honorable Minister has said, is to ensure that we vaccinate up to 70% of the eligible population uh, with the vaccines. Uh, finally, I want to assure all Nigerians that now we have the vaccines, we have the cold chain equipment all across the country. We are now going to put our words into action. Thank you very much. Question of the mask. The purpose of the mask is to protect others, primarily, primarily. Those of you who have done the test for COVID, and I believe most of you here have done it, know that when the sample is being taken, it's taken from your nose in the pharynx, and then another one through the mouth in the pharynx. What that means is that the virus resides largely in inside the depth of the nose and in the pharynx. That's where it, re it resides. Which means that if you have the virus, you might, if you are not, uh, if you are not, if you, are, if you don't have the resistance, you might get sick. Or if you have the resistance or somehow it doesn't manifest in you, you do not get sick, but you still have the virus. When a person like that sneezes or coughs, he emits aerosol droplets, tiny droplets, into the space. Some of them are so tiny that they are floating in the air for quite a while. So, which means that you can have the virus without being sick, or showing signs of sickness, or you can have it and be very sick. 
in either case, you can infect others just by spraying it into the air. The same thing happens if you shout or if you sing or if you even heavily breathe out because the virus inside your respiratory system, you throw it into the air. Now, what does that mean? If all the windows here are locked and this room is full, the chances of people breathing in that droplet is high. And many people who have resistance, about 80%, may not show any sign, but people who are about 20% can get sick, theoretically, mathematically, can get very sick. Some of them can even lose their lives. Okay? So, if you have been vaccinated, what it means is that the vaccine will protect you because you have antibodies. But if you have the virus still in infect you, you can still infect others. So getting vaccinated means that the virus will not harm me, but I, I can still get it. And if I, in a way, spread it around the room, the chances of getting other, other people getting it is very high. So I need to wear a mask despite being vaccinated because I'm protecting others, not necessarily protecting myself. Even in your own home, you can have a vulnerable grandmother or even with the Delta case now, people who don't have vulnerabilities, they can easily, because you live in close, close quarters, you can easily infect each other. Now, if all the windows are open and the doors are open and you have more circulation of air, the chances are reduced that you can get, that, that other people can get that virus from you. If you are outdoors in a meeting, the chances are even more reduced that, that other people will get infected by you. So it's all a question of relationship. Again, if you have social distancing, somebody sprays the air by coughing or sneezing and has the infection, then the further a person is from you, the less likely you will get it. That's why we speak of social distancing. That's why I say no crowding. That's why I say have good ventilation. And avoid those places where you are forced to be close to people or where windows are locked. Houses of worship, market. But market are still okay because they are largely outside. And you have a lot of circulation that dilutes whatever it is that a person sprays out. Now, if you look at the Delta variant, which means that if this room were locked, one person had COVID and sprays it out, and it could, the, the variant we knew at first could infect 100 people, the Delta variant will infect 160 because it's more easily transmissible, which means even fewer droplets can get into you and make you sick. So those are the reasons why vaccination everywhere in the world. The U.S. has vaccinated 61% of its population, but even their masks are still recommended. In some places, enforced. And in other countries where, you, where they have done even 70%, they tell you to wear your mask because you protect everybody else. I hope that answers your question in that respect. Now, as for the lockdown, the lockdown is a very, very last measure that countries have taken. Because that lockdown stifles economic activity, it restricts your own, uh, uh, your own freedom and your business, both corporate business, both government business, both private business are all affected. So a lockdown is not something you do easily. And where you have to do, and of course, when we had that lockdown, we were all compelled to have that lockdown at the beginning, we learned a lot of lessons. You know, at that time, government provided palliatives to release the, com the impact of it, if you couldn't go to market, if you couldn't do, do your business. But this is not what government is aiming to do, though government wants to do a lockdown. In countries where they have had serious threat, they have had to do what they call a, re a, a precision lockdown. You know, in UK, in fact, just Israel the other day announced that they are uh, doing some lockdown, but it's no more a generalized lockdown, but precision of certain areas. So many countries do what they call precision lockdown so that it's not everybody that will be affected, 
only certain areas, so avoid too much damage to economy, to social life. And the, uh, the, we are not at, at the level yet where we are uh, feeling that threat to do any lockdown. But uh, I tell you that many countries are not doing generalized lockdown. They are just doing precision lockdown. And as I speak to you now, there are several countries who are on one kind of lockdown or the other, at least, if my recollection is correct, at least six or seven countries that are doing one form of lockdown or the other. We do not have that on the table right now. Now, the question of... Uh, Open defecation, that's a very good question because the cholera is a waterborne disease and you will take it through contaminated water. If you drink raw water from the stream and that raw water is carrying the cholera bacteria because somebody upstream has already defecated in the water Downstream, you think you are getting pure water. You are not. So people go freely and collect water. Now others, that's why we advise boil the water. The least you can do is boil the water that you are going to drink. Boil it. If you have a chemical to treat it, you can treat it. There is some chemical treatment. Now we are looking for uh, that chemical, uh, chemical treatment now to send to areas of, uh, of concern. But even if you are not going to uh, drink the raw water, if you go into the stream to swim or to take a bath, you might mistakenly take a gulp of the, of the water. You might mistakenly. Also, when you have open defecation and it rains, parts of that fecal matter will be swept into the river. So even if somebody didn't defecate in the water, the fecal matter can be swept there by the stream, by the, uh, by the flood, or can be swept into a pool of water, into pools, puddles, after rainfall. I know that children go into puddles to go and play and practice swimming. And there, drops of these things can get into their mouth. So these are the areas where the Ministry of Water Resources has been emphasizing that the Ministry of Health has supported the Abandonment of open defecation, use the latrine. Latrines are not difficult to build. So that the risk of open defecation and sweeping of fecal matter into water that somebody is going to drink is reduced. So we are going to be having stronger collaboration. The Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Water Resources, and also the Ministry of Women Affairs, because Women Affairs, Women of the House, they control and oversee a lot of what goes on, what the children are doing, where they are swimming, where they are going. They can stop all these uh, swimming, children swimming in puddles of water. So that's very important, and thank you for raising that uh, point. Now, with the question of the strike, we have said openly that this is not a good time for doctors to go on strike. We're having a strike for the third time this year, and that is not good. We have appealed to them. We have been having long uh, meetings with the young doctors to tell them that, look, we have a certain responsibility to our country. Every country who has difficult situation at this time should understand that the responsibility is for all of us. If you have any problem, any grudges, let's talk about it. If we can't solve it now, let's continue talking until we, until we find a solution, but don't drop work. I don't know, I think Nigeria is probably the only country in the world today where doctors are dropping work in the middle of a threat to the whole country. So that's why we have advised them. There has been no threat. Nobody threatened anything. It's just an appeal. All of us are doctors. We can, all of us went through the same residency. We're saying this is not the time. Let's go on talking about it. Do not put people's lives at risk. That's what the Minister of Labor has been saying. That's what the Minister of Health has been saying. Nobody has threatened anybody with anything. Yeah, but that's a standard thing. That's International Labor Organization, ILO, recommendation that if you didn't work, uh, then why will you take... The, your salary comes from taxpayers' money. So if you didn't work, why should you go and be saying you should be paid? Because if that is so, you can be encouraged to stay home for six months and your salary is running from public, uh, from public funds from taxpayers' money, 
and you have not given the community any service. So that uh, uh, no work, no pay is not just a government regulation. It's recommended, it's specifically stated in ILO regulations, International Labor Organization, that if you do not work, if you have not given any service, you can't expect remuneration because you can't go to the market and buy something for nothing. You must put down something. You must put down uh, work. You can't go to the market and take goods without paying. So if you work, you'll be paid. And we are strongly in support of government meeting its obligations to pay what is agreed. We have said that we shall push for that. You know, working with the salaries and with this commission, the Akatan General's office, the head of service, we are working to support that, including paying all the insurance dues. But we cannot say against what the ILO says, pay people who didn't go to work. I mean, I think before God and man, that uh, you can defend that position. But there is no question of threat. These uh, young doctors, they are you know, they are, they are professionally, not just professionally, they are young people who uh, we need to also mentor and uh, treat well to the best of our lab, of all uh, our capacity here. So the threat is not what, the strike is not what we want now. We would like to, again, use this platform to ask doctors to return to work. Let us negotiate. We can do that uh, between, uh, among us, we support, there are many areas we support them. The Ministry of Health supports them. But part of the problem we have is that some of the grudges that they have, or let us say the demands they have, are with state government. They're not with federal government. So if the state government has not paid some people's salary, why go on nationwide strike? We say, if you want to talk to that state, we shall even support you and appeal to the state. Among the 12 original demands that they made, seven were state-related. They're not federal. Federal government, the Ministry of Health can't do that. We can't compel a state to pay you a certain salary that you want. But the ones that are concerning us at federal level, many of them are not even exactly the Ministry of Health either. But we support them in those ways. But strike is not a good tool to use and especially when the health of the country is threatened. When people even come out and volunteer in other countries to work, that is not the time to withdraw your own service. And I think, again, we'd continue to appeal to young doctors not to use strike as a tool, especially at a time of national need that will not rest well on your conscience. Then the question of... Uh, the percentage of people vaccinated, I think the NPACDA will answer that. About vaccines rejected by Brazil, NAVDAC will answer that. Uh, how you can get your second dose in time, NAVDAC will answer that. And the question of, uh, again, the lockdown, wearing of masks, NCDC can also cont contribute to that. Thank you. I will hand over to uh, immediately to my left, and then from there on. Uh, rejecting uh, Sputnik vaccine. Actually, Brazil rejected at the beginning. Brazil has taken uh, Sputnik back, uh, but they're doing at the same time doing clinical trials on it. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> Sputnik is being used by over 70 countries in the world. And Sputnik V has gotten uh, approval by WHO. Sputnik Light, that is a second type of vaccine, is yet to get approval. What we gave approval, what NAVDA gave approval to is Sputnik V. And uh, we started working with uh, uh, Gamalea uh, Research uh, Institute uh, that developed Sputnik since January. There are three mechanisms that we use to approve vaccine, reliance, recognition, and full review. We gave full review to Sputnik V vaccine. That is 
why it lasted six months. Because we kept going back and forth, make them, you know, provide this information and so on. So at the point when we approved, we had peace of <laughs> I had peace that yes, we can approve it. Uh, like I said, there is no vaccine that doesn't have side effects. But we also gave uh, Sputnik V approval a conditional approval that the company we partner with us in the country uh, to first of all do a small uh, vaccination program and do a cohort event monitoring uh, to ensure that the vaccine, the dose is fine. Uh, that is science, meaning we are not going to all oh, come and give us uh, 10 million doses at the same time. But this is just to ensure uh, that the dose is going to be fine. But Sputnik uh, V is a safe, is, is a quality medicine, safe, efficacious. However, because of the uh, backbone that it has, adenovirus 5 and 26, we want to be sure that those of our population that has been uh, uh, exposed to such before, uh, that it is the same dose that others that have not been exposed, uh, that is the same dose that they will be given. Uh, so we approved it uh, based on science. It is all science uh, driven. Thank you very much. Total, uh, the percentage of Nigerians that have been vaccinated uh, so far is 2.3% uh, of eligible Nigerians. And then I want to uh, draw a demarcation, clarity between uh, what you said, 70% of uh, the population, and what we're targeting. We're targeting 70% of eligible Nigerians. Those are two different concepts, right? Because the only people who are eligible for the vaccine are those that are 18% and above. Those are the people that we're targeting, okay, with the vaccine. And what we have uh, said from the beginning is that we plan to vaccinate this population, about 112 million Nigerians, within a span of two years, starting from when we uh, rolled out the vaccine. And this is still dependent on the availability of vaccines, right? So if, for example, we go through a long stretch uh, without vaccines, right? That means we cannot be vaccinating and you cannot count that uh, as among the two years that uh, we've provided. Uh, we've done the math, we've done the modeling, and we feel that uh, we'll be able to vaccinate within a span of two years, okay? So it doesn't mean that we're going to end 20, 2021, 2022, okay? Then Tony asked about, uh, you know, for those who have already uh, gotten the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, you know, how do we ensure? Are we sure that, uh, you know, uh, we're going to get the second dose and uh, what will happen if we are unable to secure the, the, the doses of the vaccines? Uh, we're in very close collaboration with our partners, and we take uh, the science very seriously. For those who have gotten the first dose of the AstraZeneca, they will definitely get their second doses uh, within the time uh, that time frame that we've provided. Uh, even as we speak, uh, we expect that in the next uh, few days we will get uh, additional doses of AstraZeneca. Uh, I think we have communicated uh, this uh, uh, in the last uh, couple of days. Uh, but even beyond uh, these uh, doses that we are getting in the next few days, we expect that before the end of August, uh, we will be getting up to 3.9 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine. So that is going to cover for the about 1.1 million uh, Nigerians uh, that we're expecting will get the second dose of uh, the AstraZeneca. So we take this very, very seriously, and we're not concerned that we will not have the vaccines to cover those that have already gotten uh, their first shots. Thank you. The COVID restrictions are different from a national lockdown. The COVID restrictions in the COVID regulations that were signed off by Mr. President have never been relaxed have never been relaxed. So please look at those restrictions and let us hold ourselves uh, accountable to living within those restrictions. Those regulations, those restrictions that are contained in the COVID regulations, 
that went through the processes signed off by Mr. President have never been relaxed, which is completely different from national lockdowns, like the Honorable Minister said, that's an extreme measure. We hope never to get there, except it's absolutely necessary, uh, but that's really not uh, where we are at the moment. So I think we can manage if we implement just what is still in place, which regulates wearing masks, mass gatherings, all the things that we talk about every day. Thank you. Now, uh, although the resident doctors have gone on strike, and as I said before, we are appealing to them not to use this very vulnerable period when the country is facing, you can call it a war, it's a war time, when we are facing a dangerous uh, virus variant. For those of you who have been very keenly following international news, you know the havoc that Delta variant did in India. I don't know how many of you are watching. And what it has done or is doing in Indonesia, Thailand, and other countries. That is a time, especially when you know that we haven't got the requisite vaccinated people's, uh, people's uh, uh, interest covered. We have only about, well, one or two percent of Nigerians, eligible Nigerians vaccinated. So we are really facing something like a war against microbe. And when you face a war, that's not the time for soldiers to say they are not going to fight. So it's a moral question I'm telling the young people that this is not the time when everybody else is rising to defend their country, you say you are going on strike. Whatever it is, the reason, some of them just, some of them don't look so just, some of them easily can be solved, others are not easily solved. It's not a time to say we are going on strike. We are with you, we are also your professional colleagues, we've been through residency, we know where you stand. It's a national call for us to come up with in arms. Let us work together, solve this problem, save lives. We don't want to see here what happened in India, where they lost over 400,000 lives due to COVID-19, Delta strain. We don't want that. So again, we are saying, using this opportunity, and I would like all of you to help to amplify that and say, no matter the, the, the problem, no matter the, the demand, we shall look into them, but let us work together to face this common enemy. You don't know who this common enemy is going to take. So all of us are humans. We don't know who. So all of us need to work together, put a joint, joint forces, and try to solve the threat to our country. But even then, during this strike, we have mobilized all consultants and youth coppers and all those who can render service to ensure that they are rendering service, to ensure that the hospital services do not collapse. And everybody is doing very well. I salute the consultants and new coppers and all those who are not on strike, who are giving service, and also the private sector who are supporting us, because the private sector is coming up to, waking up to the, rising up to the challenge, to make sure that health services somehow or the other are going on and there's no serious distress in the hospitals. But the earlier the doctors come back to work, the better it is for the whole country, the better it is for them. We shall say thank you, and we shall look into all the uh, issues that you have raised. We shall support you in addressing the issues in, you have with individual states. But we cannot solve the problem you have with any state, because there's division of power in the Constitution. The Constitution does not allow the federal government to dictate to state government uh, conditions that, uh, that the state government has put down. We can appeal. So again, let us join. And I invite you to join us and say, look, let's put this aside meanwhile and face the common enemy which is the Delta variant that threatens us. Now, uh, as for the NYSC camps, NCDC will take that part of it. 
Uh, and somebody has said that other tools are not working, what shall we do? Well, first of all, put down your strike. Lay down weapons. We don't need any tools at this time. All we need is tackle the bigger enemy, which can take lives. That's COVID-19. It can take lives if all of us don't pick up arms against it. So the other tools, we shall support you in your demands. If it is state, or if it is any of the organs that are responsible for payment of your allowances, whether it's accountant general, as I've said, or uh, wages, a lot of checks have been given out, uh, compensation for life insurance for those who uh, lost their lives, given out a lot, a large number of them have been given out. So many of these things have already been met because they say that they were not paid for life insurance for those who lost their lives, which is quite clear. But that has been, is being done to a large extent. So once there's response already coming to the questions you raised, and mind you, this slow response was coming from the insurance companies. So we have been able, able to uh, urge them to fast track their own side of the uh, agreement. And they have brought out checks which the Permanent Secretary Ministry of Health has already delivered to the uh, doctors. So government is trying its own side. But let us not bring out such tools at this time. That's my uh, appeal for that again. As for the self-test kits, well, I will also allow Dr. Ewe Kwazu to answer that question. The vaccination acceptance, this is something that is just evolving. As you know, countries who have already done uh, 60, 70 percent of their own vaccination, fearing that anybody can bring the, their own vaccination and their own infection into their country, are beginning to talk about what they call the green pass that will allow people to come in. Well, we have thought that it's not very fair because since vaccines became available, the distribution globally was not equitable. Some people had more and were able to vaccinate their citizens. Some countries hoarded so much vaccines that they could vaccinate their countries even four times over. In other countries who do not produce, we were left almost abandoned. We have done only 2%. So why, you know, if you are now asking for pass, then that will be unfair to those who didn't get a chance, not through their own fault, but because the vaccine didn't reach them. So that's a discussion that is still going on. The African Union has waded in and they called for a meeting, which we are going to attend. What are we going to do about those who are already vaccinated? Now closing the door and saying, if you are not vaccinated, you can't enter my country. We have to uh, address that issue. Now, the question of those who vaccinated in Nigeria came from the fact that every country has tested and recognized certain vaccines. NAVDA, for example, up to now has tested and given approval or rather authorization for six vaccines who applied. They applied to us. What had happened was that in, the, in, in some European countries, they were not using the Serum Institute of India made AstraZeneca vaccine that we used. And because they were not using that, they had not tested it and it was not on their list of approved vaccines. Now, it doesn't mean that that vaccine is bad. It just means that they haven't tested, they haven't given the authorization for it. So anybody who took that vaccine for them was not fully, was not acceptable, let's say. But that has been resolved. We have been told that now they recognize that version. It's the same AstraZeneca. But the point is that if it's made in South Korea or made in India, each one has to be individually authorized, even though they are the same vaccine. They had not tested or authorized the Indian type. But right now that problem is, is down. They have recognized that va vaccine. But that's the only one we have used so far. We're only going to start using the Moderna within the next few days. And uh, the African Union wants to have a whole of Africa. Because this problem you're talking about now affects the whole of Africa, not only Nigeria. So we're discussing, we're going to discuss that and come up with a common African response 
to that new concept of issuing green pass to peoples. Now, question, how many Delta variants? Uh, also NCDC. Uh, there was a question about buying vaccines, correct? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, what was the question again in detail? Yes, okay. Yes, Nigeria has bought vaccines. In fact, the ones who have been gifted are just a few million, four million here, 700,000 there, 100,000 there. Nigeria has bought 29 million, nearly 30 million, little bit short of 30 million, 29 million, 850,000 Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the single shot vaccine. And at the time we bought it, it was $10 a shot. The price has dropped to $750. And we bought it from African Vaccine Acquisition Tax Team through the African Union. First deal, we're taking the whole of Africa approach. Now that the price has dropped, we are going to get even more than that because the balance will be used to purchase even more. And we shall get nearly $40 million doses paid for by Nigerian government, federal government. It's 750 per dose now. It was $10 when we first started, but the price came down, and then that means we get more than we had uh, actually originally booked. So that we boost our vaccine stock, and that tells you clearly that majority of vaccines going to be used in Nigeria is procured by government. It's not just a gift. Well, first of all, I will tell you that the transaction is not directly with the producer. It's going with the Afrexim Bank. Afrexim Bank pays for the vaccines, and all countries now deal with the Afrexim Bank, which is based in Cairo. That's the arrangement that has been made by AVAT. The AVAT is an instrument that is serving the whole of Africa approach. Since many of our usual friends and partners in Europe, they didn't come to our aid. The Africans got together to the African Union and formed the African Vaccine Tax Team, chaired by the President of South Africa, and taking care of the needs of African countries. Even those who cannot immediately mobilize the money will not be left, will not be abandoned. The Africa Afrexim Bank will pay for the vaccines, and then you now pay with the, to the Afri Afrexim Bank according to the arrangement you make. If you have the cash to pay at once, you do that. If you have, don't have the cash, you may have a payment uh, uh, plan. But you will not be abandoned. That is what they call the whole of Africa approach. This is new, and I think that's a very, very good thing uh, to take care of ourselves. And it is the same uh, AVAT team that is now pushing for vaccine manufacturing capability in Africa, for which Nigeria is also bidding to be a vaccine manufacturing center. When are you expecting the vaccine? The what? The manufacturing? The manufacturing is a process. It takes a long time. Apart from building the factory, you also have to get, get a license from those who are manufacturing who transfer the technology. Some countries have said that they are willing to drop their intellectual property rights because if somebody manufactured it, he has to give you the technology and you cannot use it. You can't steal it and use it because you are breaking the patency law. But that's a process that's going on and we have been promised support by Nigerians in good standing. We are having another meeting on Sunday to continue to prepare our case. And the, the government has a, there's a company where the government has 49% interest, which we are going to, uh, which we are supporting to be uh, our candidate to produce a vaccine, not only for Nigeria, but for Africa. So that process is going very well to put us into that uh, category. But this is a whole of Africa approach, which is help, very helpful uh, for, for that. So that, that also answers the question of when the vaccines will be available. We can't say exactly when yet, because it depends on very many other factors on negotiating uh, intellectual property rights 
the capital for it. We are hoping that some money will be appropriated and put down for it, for down payment, so that, uh, but we have the manpower here. We have a company in which government has 49% with the private sector, so it meets all the conditions. And besides, Nigeria is the greatest market for such a vaccine. So we hope that we'll get that uh, support, international support, to start producing. But the date of starting depends on factors that are beyond control for now. So I think that is all for my side. I'll allow the uh, heads of agencies to, uh, do, to do justice to the questions that were posed to them. Safety of the vaccines for pregnant uh, uh, or expectant mothers. Uh, we go with the science. Uh, in Israel, U.S., uh, a lot of pregnant women have been given the vaccines, and uh, they have concluded that it is safe, or they are safe to use, depending on the type of vaccine that uh, you have. However, uh, that will be between the pregnant mother, uh, woman, and their doctor. Their doctor must advise them, but from all that we can see from literature or from publications, scientific publications, uh, pregnant women in the US especially have been given a very significant number and they have not reported any uh, undue uh, serious side effects. In fact, that encouraged uh, Pfizer uh, to step down the age for their own vaccine to 12. Uh, so now they are getting, you know, vaccinating, you know, 12 year, 12 year old and above. And uh, they are going to even step it further down to six months uh, because they've seen that for pregnant women, their babies, uh, as far as we know, uh, had no uh, side effects. So that would be the only uh, response that I can give. Thank you. Particular question about when we're going to start receiving uh, the J&J uh, &J vaccine that was procured by the government of Nigeria. Uh, earlier in my address, I, I was specific in saying that we got a, about 176,000 doses of the J&J &J vaccine yesterday. So that is part of the uh, 29,850,000 doses uh, that the federal government procured. So we have started receiving the vaccines. We'll get additional doses of the J&J &J vaccine uh, before the end of the month. And the plan is to continue to bring this in batches until the 29,850,000 doses uh, is fulfilled. Thank you. So uh, four quick answers. First one is on cholera. Uh, this year we've had uh, 31,000 cases and 816 deaths from cholera. So we have to put that into perspective. This is a disease that uh, should have been history in, in our country many years ago. So that's the current challenge that we face. The, the second question was on the NYSE camps. Um, I, I really haven't seen or heard what and I may say it, so I can't really comment to that. But I must say that the, the NYSC exercise must really be celebrated as a national success story. This is an important uh, program for the country that is time bound. So if you stop, imagine you stop camp for six months. People are graduating, so people will start accumulating and we have a backlog. So from last year, we worked out a, a plan with the DG of NYSC, uh, spread out the period of the camp more, reduced the numbers in every camp. So a lot of investments go into this. Uh, came up with a program to test every single person going into youth service, provided every camp with the IPC materials they needed, trained champions for infection control among couples. So I, I think this is a fantastic um, intervention by several federal government and state partners because the state governments have been involved in every state where this has been carried out, which has enabled, uh, despite this pandemic, for us to continue uh, carrying out this important program for the country. 
NYC is, imagine an education system in the country without youth coppers. You know, a lot of teachers at the state level, a lot of primary health care centers depend on coppers. And they also learn. So once you stop this program, there are consequences that are way beyond uh, what is normally uh, understandable to be the consequence. So we have to really uh, encourage uh, the collaborators that have made this possible uh, for us to continue. Yes, there will always be a few bottlenecks here and there, but we mustn't stop this important program uh, for the country. The third uh, question was on self-test kits. You know, um, I, I think we, we have to be realistic in terms of what we compare ourselves to. There's no country in Africa or in Southeast Asia that is using self-test kits at the moment because the kits are not the problem. It depends on an educated population uh, to do that test yourself. You need to really understand, read directions in detail, do the test, take it to the post office, post it. Uh, it will be received in a lab. They do the test, post it back to you. So there are several factors that are required to make a system like this work that we are still in the process of developing. We are not yet fully there. So we, we have to do what we are able to do. What we have, however, done is make sure that we are now taking the RDT testing kits to all levels of the health sector, including primary health care. So we're working with our colleagues in the MPACD and all the other programs delivering health care at the primary health care level, wherever there's competence to do whatever test, whether it's pregnancy test, HIV test is a similar process to do the RDT. So we are reducing, taking it down to the lowest level of healthcare provision in the country to make it more um, accessible. Uh, the final question for me was on sequencing. So remember, we're not sequencing all viruses, all positives, right? We, can, we cannot do that. It's a very complex process. So we always take a number of them and sequence. So far, we've done 76. Uh, we found 76 uh, Delta variants out of those sequenced, but the most important uh, uh, indicator to count is what I mentioned, that 80% of those sequenced recently in the last three weeks are the Delta variant, which is a fairly representative sample to most cases in the country apart from Lagos. We are not yet sequencing enough from Lagos. We're working with them very closely to get more positives to sequence, but at least we're fairly confident that what is driving the increase in cases in Nigeria right now is partly the non-adherence uh, to the public health measures, but secondly, uh, the emergence of uh, the Delta variant as the dominant variant in Nigeria, which is the same as what is happening in many other countries in the world. Thank you. Thank you.